If you would find with us the book of Zechariah, chapter 9, the book of Zechariah, chapter 9, so it's going to be towards the end of the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 9, so just before Malachi is where that's at, and uh, we'll be looking at specifically verses 9 through verse 17, uh, but I am going to read uh, the entire chapter just to give you a little bit of context here of what precedes the verses that we will pay closer attention to. So Zechariah chapter 9, beginning there, verse 1. Zechariah writes here, The oracle of the word of the Lord is against the land of Hadrach, and Damascus is its resting place. For the Lord has an eye on mankind and on all the tribes of Israel. And a map also, which borders on it, Tyre and Sidon, though they are very wise. Tyre has built herself a rampart, and heaped up silver like dust, and fine gold like the mud of the streets. But behold, the Lord will strip her of her possessions, and strike down her power on the sea, and she shall be devoured by fire. Ashkelon shall see it and be afraid, Gaza too, and shall writhe in anguish. Ekron also, because its hopes are confounded, the king shall perish from Gaza, Ashkelon shall be uninhabited. A mixed people shall dwell in Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of Lystia. I will, make, I will take away its blood from its mouth and its abominations from between its teeth. It too shall be a remnant for our God. It shall be like a clan in Judah, and Ephron shall be like the Jebusites. Then I will encamp at my house as a guard, so that none shall march to and fro, no oppressor shall again march over them, for now I see with my own eyes. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humbled and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot and Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. He shall, his rule shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. For I have bent Judah as my bow, I have made Ephraim its arrow. I will stir up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and wield you like a warrior's sword. Then the Lord will appear over them, and his arrow will go forth like lightning. The Lord God will sound the trumpet and will march forth in the whirlwinds of the south. The Lord of hosts will protect them, and they shall devour and tread down the sling stones and they shall drink and roar as if drunk with wine, and be like a and be full like a bowl, drenched like the corners of the altar. On that day, the Lord their God will save them as the flock of His people, for they for like the jewels of a crown, they shall shine on His land. For how great is His goodness, and how great His beauty! Grain shall make the young men flourish, and new wine the young women. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you um, for this opportunity to gather, uh, to worship, uh, to celebrate your goodness and your grace to us, Lord, to allow our minds and our hearts to be reminded of who you are, uh, Lord, what you have accomplished, what you have promised to yet accomplish. And God, we understand today that without the help of your spirit, Lord, that the words I say uh, and the words that we hear will uh, be meaningless and pointless and fall on deaf ears. And so, God, we ask that as it sounds like my voice being spoken today, that it will be the Holy Spirit that is directing it, and it will be the Holy Spirit that is 
explaining and magnifying it within our hearts so that we may be able to behold and see the wonderful mysteries that are found in your truth. And God, we pray that your will would be accomplished for us in your son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. One of the, one of the most vivid memories in my mind would be December the 11th of 2010. In case you didn't know, that's the day Camille and I got married. And I just wanted to embarrass her, so I'm going to share uh, this story. But I remember that day very vividly as it was raining, as some would say, cats and dogs outside. As the time proceeding up to the time that we got married seemed like an eternity, and I'm talking about just that day. And as I stood at the altar of Community Baptist Church and waited for those doors to open in the back, and finally they swung open. And I saw two of the most different expressions one could ever see in his life. As I saw Camille standing there with the biggest grin I think I'd ever seen, the happiest I had ever seen her. That happiness sometimes fades, but it mostly stays there. <laughs> and then as I looked on her dad's face and saw him as solemn as I had ever seen him, and that look has not faded <laughs> off of his face. But as I was standing there waiting for her to walk down the aisle, I was reminded that I had been waiting on this day for most of my life, waiting for the day that I would be free in some respects, but I was somewhat wrong. That was a joke, by the way. <laughs> waiting for the person that God had set aside and prepared for me that I could spend the rest of my life with. And while I stood there that day watching Camille walk down the aisles, certainly I did not know all the things that would accompany being married, but there was no doubt in my mind that that was the day I had longed for. I was not just going through the motions. I was not just following a crowd. I was there because I was convinced that she was the one I was waiting on. Now, if we could rewind that clock some 2,000 years, and there are a group of people that we read about in the book of John, chapter number 12, that have gathered themselves around an aisle of sort to watch the procession of who they may or may not have thought was the person that they had been waiting for their entire lives. No, this was not a wedding ceremony, but this was a ceremony nonetheless as the one who had claimed himself to be the Messiah had determined to finally make his entrance into Jerusalem. And there were a crowd of people, again, whether or not they were truly convinced or whether they were just going through the motions of celebrating the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem, there they were witnessing and fulfilling the prophecy that we've read about here in Zechariah chapter number 9. They were witnessing with their own eyes, seeing the fulfillment around them, hearing the sounds of the crowd, seeing the palm trees being waved, witnessing as Jesus has mounted this cold and is coming into Jerusalem, the person that they had so desperately longed to see. But yet, by the end of that week, there would be many of them who stood along that aisle that day watching that procession who no longer believed that the one who had come in on that donkey in Jesus was the Messiah that they had been longing for. And this morning, we're not necessarily going to investigate why they so quickly changed their mind, but we want to investigate why they would even participate in this ceremony in the beginning? What was it that was lifting their hearts out of a desire to see Zechariah chapter number 9 fulfilled? Why would they gather themselves there in hopes that Jesus was Messiah? And so to do that, we've got to understand why Zechariah wrote what he wrote. 
And Zechariah is ministering to uh, a, a diverse group of people, really. Some 530 odd years before Jesus enters into Jerusalem, they have been a people living in exile. They have slowly made their way back to Jerusalem, a lot of the Jewish people, but even though they're there, they're not really there because they're not under their own authority. They are still being controlled by foreign governments. They are still experiencing the heartbreak of being a divided nation where you had uh, uh, different kingdoms with the northern and the southern kingdom. And Zechariah is writing to them because he knows that they are a desperate people. He knows that they're lonely. He knows that they desire to be free, that they desire to have uh, God's promises of old finally fulfilled so that they could worship God, uh, so that they could have their own uh, communities, their own religion without influence of outside influence. And so as Zechariah is writing this, he's writing this to a down people that he is trying to encourage. And as we read a passage of scripture like this, we can really begin to think, what in the world does this have to do with me? Because I don't live in Israel. I, I'm not living as an exile in the sense that I am home among my own people. I don't feel necessarily discouraged or despondent. I, I have some hope and confidence. And what I hope that we can leave here today and understand that as, as Zechariah is writing this passage in the sense that he's trying to encourage them by looking forward, that I think today that we can look back and forward and find the same encouragement that Zechariah is trying to help them with. So as he's writing to a discouraged and despondent people, he essentially says, look, lift up your heads, be encouraged, because there is a king that's coming, and he is a worthy king. And you and I can say today that there is a king that has come and is coming again, and he is a worthy king. Amen. So let's look at the description that Zechariah gives to us about why he is worthy. And the first thing that I'd like to just point out to you is that is Jesus is worthy of our worship. Jesus is worthy of our worship. Now this is going to stand in stark contrast to what they were currently experiencing because the political leaders of that day were worthy of anything but worship. And even as they look back throughout their own history, going back to some respected leaders like David and Solomon, and even some respect Saul, and down the list you could go, there were men that were worthy of their respect, but none of them were worthy of their worship. But that's not true of Jesus. And as he's writing this passage of scripture to the Israelites, I've kind of told you a little bit about the circumstances where they are a, a divided people, they're living as exiles even in their own country. They have attempted to start rebuilding the temple that had been destroyed, but those things had been thwarted. They were not free as they liked to be free. It wasn't the Israel that they knew. I don't know how else to describe it to you other than they were just living in a state of depression because things were horrible. But yet Zechariah has the nerve to tell them in verse number 9 that they are to rejoice. And they are to shout out loud. I don't know about you, but when I'm down, the last thing I want is for somebody to come by and tell me, hey, look, rejoice, right? <laughs> or start smiling. Everything's going to be okay. <laughs> Especially if you don't have some good news for me. Certainly, if you tell me, look, I know you're down today, but everything that's wrong today, tomorrow's going to be okay, then maybe I can get to that place where I can rejoice. But the reality of it is that we don't use the word rejoice very often in our day and age. When is the last time you were just walking around town 
and heard somebody that was not a believer and said, hey, I'm rejoicing today. Think about it. Have you heard that? The only time I hear the word rejoice is when I'm talking to another believer. And then I don't hear much then either. So it's when we're reading the Bible. So what does rejoice mean? It's essentially the idea of celebrating. Of expressing gratitude. Expressing admiration. Expressing happiness. It is anything other than what you would automatically think about when you think about how these people were living their lives. There's another word that is used to describe that, that could be translated. Instead of rejoice, it could be used exult. How many of you use exult in your everyday language? Not many. But John Piper said about what exultation is. It is the open treasuring of the divine glories. And so when Zechariah is telling them to rejoice despite their circumstances, he's not just telling them to put a smile on their face. He's telling them to be in a state of awe and telling them to be in a state of reverence, a state of respect, but at the same time, a state of celebration and of gladness and even peace, you could describe it as. And he takes it a step further. And oftentimes in the poetic writings, we understand that when something with a similar idea is repeated, they're not just looking for filler words. They're doing it to help reinforce the idea. So he says rejoice, but then he says to shout out loud. Now, if you're anything like me, I'm not going to shout out loud for much, right? I'm quiet, reserved, unless I'm at home and then I'm not quiet and reserved. But essentially, what Zachariah is telling them to do is take off the reservation. Take off that guardrail that you put around yourself that keeps you from outwardly expressing your gladness and your happiness and shout out loud. I know you're, you're listening to me now and you're saying, Daniel, there's no way you don't like to shout. That's what you're doing. <laughs> That's another story for a different time, right? There's another word there, though, that gives us the idea of taking off the guardrail, and that's when he said to rejoice greatly. He didn't say rejoice just a little bit. Rejoice reservedly. Rejoice so everybody knows your badness and not something else. Right? He says to rejoice greatly. And again, the way to what Zechariah is encouraging them to do really begins to sink in once we understand that in, in their minds there was no reason to rejoice. There was no temple to go to. There was no king of Israel to follow. There was nothing for them, but yet Zechariah says rejoice. But he doesn't do that without giving them some good news. A reason to rejoice. In verse 9, he's told them that a king is coming. And this king is not coming solely for his own benefit as kings they had known previously who were just after power, wealth, and fame. But this king was coming on their behalf. He was bringing salvation to them. He was coming to redeem them from their sins, to forgive it and to wipe it away. He says he's coming as a humble king. Verse 11, he says he's coming to fulfill the promise that he made to Abraham. Verse 12, I'm coming to bring restoration to the nation of Israel. And in verse 17, he kind of just sums it up by saying, how great is his goodness and his beauty. He gives them reason to worship. But we need to clear something up. What is worship? Often.
oftentimes when we hear the word worship, we're thinking about what we did just a few moments ago in singing. Very rarely do we use worship to describe what I'm doing right now. And what you're doing, hopefully, as I'm doing this. We rarely ever use the word worship to describe what we did in between the songs in giving financially. Do we use worship to describe what we're going to do this afternoon as we all gather down around the table and enjoy some food? Do we use worship to describe what you did last night, hopefully for a good length of time and sleeping? Do we use worship to describe what you might do tomorrow morning as you get up and go to work? We don't often think about that because in our minds we're thinking again of worship as singing. So what is worship? Well, the same author who gave us the description earlier says that the inner essence of worship is to know God truly and then to respond from the heart to that knowledge by valuing, treasuring, prizing, enjoying, and being satisfied with God above all things. And then that deep, restful, joyful satisfaction in God overflows in demonstrable acts of praise from the lips and demonstrable acts of love in serving others for the sake of Christ. So if I could put that in layman's terms for you, worship is knowing God, valuing God above all else, and then letting that come out in everything we say and do. It starts with knowing about God and valuing God. And then it comes out in the way that we live. So you think about it this way. You come into church this morning and you had an awful night last night. You had an awful trip on the way over here. Everything that could have gone wrong went wrong, including the road being closed, apparently. If you lived on the right side of town, you wouldn't have that happen. <laughs> My side of the road was clear. And you walk into church and we get up and we sing a song we've never heard before. But yet we sing it like we know it. Regardless of who's hearing us, regardless of how foolish we may seem, why? Because if I know anything about Jesus, I, I know that he is my only hope Amen. in life and death. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If I know anything about Jesus, I know that his mercy is more than enough for me. Amen. If I know anything about Jesus, I know that his sacrifice is enough to take care of the sin that I have struggled with, that I may have fallen into once again. And so I sing that out of an acknowledgement that is true and that he is worth praising for. But let's back up just a moment. You had a horrible day yesterday. Everything was going wrong. Your to-do list is 10 miles long. How are you ever going to get it done? The alarm clock goes off. You know you have two hours to get to church. You don't feel like it. There's other things you could be doing. But yet as an act of worship, you decide you're going to be in church anyway. Why? Because what you know about God is true. And you know that he is worth prioritizing that time to come and to worship him. Amen. That is what worship is. It starts with what we know. It comes out in what we value. And it displays itself in how we live every single day. Zechariah says, look, there is a king that's coming 
who is worthy of your worship. And what I'm telling you today is that there is a king who has come and a king that is coming again who is worthy of our worship. Second thing I want to show you this morning is that he is also worthy of our confidence. He is worthy of our confidence at the risk of sounding redundant. Let me remind you that things are not okay in their world. Life is not like they dreamed it to be. Life is not like they wanted and planned for it to be. Life is not good. But yet Zechariah says, look, there's a king that's coming. He's coming for you. And he is worth you having some confidence. He, 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 he gives them a boost here of confidence. How do we see this? Well, let me draw your attention all the way back to verse number one. Zechariah says, the oracle of the word of the Lord. The confidence in what they were about to hear does not come out of respect for Zechariah. It does not come because they value his ministry to them. It comes because what they are about to hear is the word of the Lord. This is God's message to them. It's not Zachariah's opinion. It's not something that he just copied from somebody else. But no, it's a direct message from God. And I hope and pray this morning that when you hear me speak... That that's what you're hearing. Not my opinions, preferences, anything other than this is what God's word has to say for you. And if that's the case, you can have some confidence in what I'm saying. If you believe it to be God's word. In verses 2 through 8, he's giving them confidence by describing to them that God is going to defeat their enemies. Verse number 13. Notice how this is written in the past tense. He says, for I have bent Judah as my bow, and I have made Ephraim as its arrow. Now, these things have not yet come to pass. But yet he writes it in the past tense because when God says he's going to do something, it says he's already done it. And then I want you to notice in verses 14 and 15 how many times he uses these words, the Lord will. He says, then the Lord will appear over them and his arrow will go forth like lightning the Lord God will sound the trumpet and will march forth in the whirlwinds of the south the Lord of hosts will protect them and they shall devour and tread down the sling stones and they shall drink water as if drunk uh, with wine and be full like a, a, a bowl of drinks like the corners of the altar Again, what God says is going to happen is as if it's ever happened. And so Zechariah's message is that because Jesus the King is coming, you can live with the confidence that everything's going to be okay. Even though it doesn't look like everything's going to be okay. This weekend, as you probably know, is the weekend of the Final Four in college basketball. And, why is that funny? <laughs> and as we sit back and watch in amazement, those with just unreal talents, it's one thing to appreciate athletics, but to be able to appreciate the skill and the precision of which major college athletics perform. It's just amazing. But one of the more amazing things that always sticks out to me is when there is a team that is losing, it looks like they're going to get beat, but yet they don't look like it. They don't panic. They don't start jacking up threes every time they touch the ball. They don't start fouling every chance they get. They don't start arguing with one another. They don't start questioning the coach, the, the calls the coach is making. Although this rarely happens, but sometimes they're not fussing at the referees. But they're down. 
But yet there are some teams on the flip side of that that as soon as they get down two points, teammates won't pass each other the ball. The point guard's calling a completely different play than what the coach drew up. Somebody's trying to be the hero and throws the ball completely out of bounds. Somebody can't hit the broad side of the barn, but yet they're still shooting. Why is that? that that's because they don't have confidence that they can stick to the game plan and still win the game. But there's something remarkable about a team that's down that still has that confidence that the tide is going to turn and that they can come back and win. And that's the confidence that Zechariah is trying to instill in the nation of Israel. It looks like your team is down. In fact, it looks like you've already lost. But just stick to the game plan and have confidence that Jesus can do what Jesus has promised to do. That was for them. Now, how about for us? They were looking forward. We're looking back and forward. You and I can be confident this morning that although we struggle with sin, that our sins have been forgiven mm -hmm. because we place our trust in Christ. You and I can be confident this morning that although it seems like at times that this world is all there is, that there is an eternity waiting for us. And that eternity is in heaven because of our faith in Christ. You and I can be confident this morning that even though it seems like the devil is winning, the world is falling apart, all of the evil and all of the tragedy we see, and it seems like the devil has the upper hand. You and I can be confident that we're on the winning side. Amen. The Bible does not just exclude this to one part of Scripture, but I'm reminded of what John would write in John, 1 John 5, 13. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life not that you can hope not that you can wish but that you can have some confidence now in just a moment I'm going to start wrapping this up and notice that word start I can emphasize that <laughs> wrapping this up by showing you that he is worthy of our hope but you may say Daniel what is the difference between confidence and hope is there a distinction? I'm going to argue yes, because I believe that this confidence that Zachariah was encouraging them to live with is something that could be true today. They could be confident that Jesus was coming even though they hadn't yet seen him per se. And what I mean by that is to say that you and I can be confident that our sins are forgiven. We can be confident that we can spend eternity with Christ just like it's already happened even though it has not yet happened. And what I want to talk to you about now is about Jesus being worthy of our hope. In the sense that there are some things that God has promised that have not yet come to fruition. And as you read Zechariah chapter number 9 and you begin to parse out, to study, to investigate whether or not all these things have come true. Because surely if I could tell you, look. Verse 1, verse 2, all the way down through verse, it's already all come true. That would boost your amount of confidence, right? Well, not all of it has come true. Some of it is still yet to be experienced, and that's where our hope comes in. So why is there something all the way back in the book of Zechariah chapter number 9 that hasn't happened yet? We're in 2023. Well, what's happening here? is that Zechariah is given this vision from the Lord. He's looking out and he's seeing 
the first coming of Christ. And then he's also seeing the second coming of Christ, but he's not seeing that span of time between the two. So you can almost picture it as we look around and see our mountains. As you're driving up, you see one mountain and another mountain. They look like they're inches apart. But as you get closer to them, you realize they are miles apart. And so Zechariah has kind of joined together here the first and the second comings of Christ. And so there are some things here that you and I are certainly hoping to happen. And as you begin to look at these, and we'll talk about some of them in just a moment, perhaps the most beautiful word picture in this entire chapter is found in verse number 12. He says, Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. To me, that sounds a little bit of an oxymoron. And no, I didn't just call you a moron. If you're paying attention, you'd understand I said oxymoron. You can laugh, it's okay. <laughs> Take off the reservations this morning. I would bet that if you toured the prisons across this country, you would find very few prisoners of hope. Maybe those who just got in would have some hope that their convictions will be overturned, that there will finally be that exculpatory evidence that will set them free. And maybe those that are getting close to the end of their sentence have some hope that nothing bad's going to happen between now and then and I'm going to get out of here. But those who are in it any length of time, there will definitely come a point where all hope is gone. Where you can't allow yourself to think about what is to come because you've got to get through what is. But yet Zechariah says that they are to be prisoners of hope. That they are to have something to look forward to. What is that? Well, verses 1 through 8. That God is going to defeat their enemies. That there is a Messiah that's coming. And that they, as a nation, will be unified again in verse 10. In verse number 11, that they will be free from captivity. In verse number 12, that God will restore to them the blessings that have been taken. Verses 14, that God's going to protect them. But what is the basis of that hope? It is not a blind hope. The basis of that hope is in verse number 11. Where he says, As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you. So the basis of their hope is not because of their faithfulness, that God's going to bless them, but it's of God's faithfulness that he's going to bless them. And we know, like I said, a lot of what they were hoping for has come to pass, but there's a lot of it that has not yet happened. The second return hasn't happened yet. When that's going to happen, I don't know. What it's going to look like, I don't know. But I know it's going to happen. I know that all the wrongs and the evils we see in this world is going to come to an end one day. That's a hope that I have. A hope that I have is that when my life ends on this earth that I'm going to be with Christ in eternity. But it's not because I deserve it. It's not because I've been faithful enough. It's not because I hit the spiritual lottery, so to speak. But it's because God is faithful to the covenant that he made. And because I have decided to place my faith and my trust in him. And he is worthy of that hope. That everything he's promised is going to bring to fruition. How did I know? 
on the December the 11th, 2010, that the woman who walked down the aisle that day was the fulfillment of all my hopes and dreams. That she was the one God had prepared for me. That she was the one I'm to spend the rest of my life with. How did I know that? All I got to do is look at my marriage certificate. Right? My name's on it. Her name's on it. Some reverend somewhere signed it. Some court official signed it. That's all I need to know, right? Now, certainly there's a lot more to it. And certainly I could be a little more mushy and gushy if I wanted to be, but I know you don't have time for that. But that certificate is the evidence that she's my wife. Now let's ask that same question of those people who had gathered around that procession on that day in Jerusalem. How could they have known that Jesus was the one they had been waiting for their entire lives? All they would have to do is wait a few more days until on Good Friday Jesus Christ would be hung on the cross of Calvary to where he would shed his own blood in direct fulfillment of the sin sacrifices that were called for in the Old Testament but being the complete one time sacrifice for sin all they'd have to do is go and check that empty grave on Sunday morning where a man that they knew to be dead was no longer there and he was now among the living. That's all they had to do, really. And we'll leave it for another day to discuss about why they might have missed that. But God was certainly fulfilling the promise there for them. He gave them all they needed to see. And you and I this morning have the good fortune of being able to know the whole story. Of being able to look back and to look forward. And we can see a king that is worthy of our worship. A king that is worthy of our confidence. And a king that is worthy of our hope. Not just because he went down the aisle in Jerusalem that we read about both the fulfillment and the prophecy. But because we know that he completed the most important piece when he sacrificed his life so that you and I can have a relationship with him. So this morning, if there's anything I'd like for you to do, as I've tried to paint a picture of a worthy king to you this morning, is for you to put your faith and trust in him. To turn to him. Allow us the opportunity to take God's word and show you how your sins can be forgiven. How you can have that kind of confidence. And if you've done that, allow that to be the basis of worship that's not a feeling, but that is a knowledge. In a confidence that you're sure Christ has saved you. And then in a hope that you know that God's going to fulfill all the promises that he has made.